Well, let's go ahead and uh, get started. We'll kick the program off, and I think uh, more people are arriving all the time, and uh, we'll certainly welcome them. I'm Ben Hill, and I'm with uh, ATDC Georgia Tech's Technology Business Center, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to today's Clean Energy Speaker Series. Today's program is part four of an ongoing discussion of issues related to the smart grid. So just to kind of um, recap where we've come from, we have uh, looked at the state of the smart grid, data management issues of the smart grid, electric vehicles and integration in the smart grid, and today, of course, we're looking at the high voltage grid of the future. And maybe when we finish this uh, series will have a very good idea and insights into some of the issues and dynamics and the readiness of the marketplace, the economics, and the technology to address these issues facing us with respect to the smart grid. This series, the clean energy series, is also an ongoing discussion about the role of clean energy and its place in meeting the energy demand of the Southeast over the next 20 years. So I would encourage you to go to our website, secleanenergy.org, and uh, you can f on that site you can find previous webcasts as well as archived copies of all the presentations, which uh, turns out we're accumulating quite a bit of really valuable and compelling information about clean energy and its important role in the Southeast for the future. Um, a number of organizations make this series possible, and I'd like to recognize them and express our appreciation for uh, their visionary sponsorship and support of the series. First, I'd like to recognize the law firm Sutherland for their um, kind of far-sighted support from the beginning. From the get-go, they, uh, they stepped up and uh, uh, not only provided financial sponsorship, but have also brought speakers from their partnership uh, to participate in an ongoing discussion. I'd also like to recognize uh, McKinsey & Company, who's a thought participant in the series, South Face Institute, Georgia Tech, and of course my home group, the ATDC and the Enterprise Innovation Institute, the Book Buyers Institute for Sustainable Systems, the uh, Georgia Tech Strategic Energy Institute, who's also a financial sponsor and participant, and the Georgia Tech Office of Sustainability. In addition, we have a great group of advisors, four faculty from Georgia Tech and two thought leaders from the community. And I would encourage you, once again, to go to our website and you can see the bios of uh, the advisors for the program. Uh, as mentioned, today's presentation is being webcast and that webcast is found on secleanenergy.org. And then, as mentioned, there's also archived copies of this presentation and uh, other presentations on that website. Um, for those, of, the format of today's program is after introductions, we'll have uh, our speakers make their presentations, then we'll uh, change the format into a Q&A session. And for those of you who have questions, uh, please, e uh, uh, those of you on the web who have questions, please email those questions to me at my email address, which is ben.hill at gatech.edu, B-E-N dot H-I-L-L at G-A-T-E-C-H dot E-D-U. And uh, we also look forward to having questions from those of you uh, in the audience. Um, plans for the speaker series are to take off the summer and reconvene in September, the last Wednesday in September. And, uh, but during the summer, we won't be idle. We will be sending you uh, a survey uh, so you, we can get your input and comments about programs which you would like to have in the upcoming school year. Uh, your input is, is very, uh, not only appreciated, but it's very important to us in kind of developing a programming scheme that meets your needs and makes this whole series uh, valuable for you. So uh, just look for an email probably mid to late uh, June with uh, sur for a survey. Um, as I said, the uh, next Clean Energy Speaker Series will be the last September, 
September 28th, so you can circle your calendars and we'll be in touch with you with uh, announcements for that program. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dorothy Franzoni, who is chair of Sutherland's Renewable and uh, Alternative Energy Team, who will in, uh, introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, can, can everybody hear me okay? All right, good. Um, thank you. Um, Sutherland is a long-standing um, citizen of the Atlanta community, and um, we also have offices in Washington, D.C., Houston, and New York. And we have a, we have a very extensive energy practice. We, um, we have clients in the oil and gas um, area. We have clients in the electric utility industry. We have clients who are um, both uh, large purchasers and large sellers of um, all sorts of energy products. Um, so the the need for clean energy around around the United States and in particular in the Southeast is of particular importance to our clients. And so when Ben approached us with the idea for the speaker series, we were very excited about becoming a part of it and helping bring together um, the academic community, the regulatory community, and our client base to talk about these important issues. So we're very proud to be sponsors um, of today's um, event as well as the ongoing event um, next year. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, both of our speakers. First, uh, we'll have um, a presentation from Jimmy Glotfelty, who is currently the Executive Vice President of External Affairs for Clean Line Energy. And Jimmy will do a much better job than I could of telling you what Clean Line is all about, so I'm going to let him do that. But let me tell you a little bit about his background, because he is um, clearly an expert in transmission issues, and um, we will, I'm certain, learn a lot. Uh, prior to Clean Line Energy, he was um, with ICF Consulting as a Vice President of Energy Markets. Before that, Jimmy served with the U.S. Department of Energy, where he founded and directed their Office of Electric Transmission and Distribution, which was a $100 million a year transmission and distribution research and development <coughs> program. He was the lead U.S. representative to the joint U.S.-Canadian Power System Outage Task Force that investigated the blackout of August of 2003. So I'm also looking forward for an explanation of that. <laughs> um, then also at DOE, Jimmy um, led teams that focused on researching transmission and development, I'm sorry, transmission and distribution technologies, uh, getting presidential permits for cross-border transmission lines, studying the impacts of the new regional transmission organizations, identifying major transmission bottlenecks, and securing our energy infrastructure. Um, so clearly, a lot of expertise uh, brought to bear, and I'm uh, very excited about what, what Jimmy and Cleanliner are, are doing to pull that together. After uh, Jimmy, um, one of my partners, Dan Frank, from our Washington office, will um, talk with us some about the regulatory environment in which a company like Cleanline is, is attempting to work and um, how that affects the possibilities for the future. Dan um, has a, a long career representing energy trading companies, electric cooperatives, and other electric utilities, meaning generators and end users, end users um, at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and at state public utility commissions, and um, in, in connection with the NERC compliance matters. He counsels transmission owners and other market participants on transmission access, pricing and cost allocation issues. He's drafted um, interconnection and transmission service agreements, and he advises clients in their transmission disputes. So um, welcome both to Jimmy and Dan to today's event, and we look forward to hearing from both of you. So for now, I'll turn it over to Jimmy. I don't need this one. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Can you hear me on the webcast also? Um, I hope so. So um, I'm not going to stand behind here too much. It's a uh, it's 
kind of a close quarters there. But thank you all for having me. I uh, uh, don't get down to the southeast too, too often, especially to talk about transmission into an area that uh, is pretty heavily regulated and uh, really manages their own transmission extremely well. Um, but what I am here to do is uh, to tell you about a project that we're trying to do. Um, it will be a, uh, it's unique and it's innovative. Um, it is uh, not mandated. It's a uh, free market. Um, I think a lot of the things that uh, folks in the southeast uh, stand for, that's what they want in their power system. They want low cost power, uh, things that are not mandated from Washington, um, but uh, maybe on cutting edge. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, Clean Line, um, kind of a little bit about um, kind of where we stand in, in the projects that we're doing and why we're doing them, and a little bit about the pricing issues, how, how our projects might compare with, with other alternatives out there, uh, and then talk a little, very little bit about kind of the integration of renewables. Um, I'll uh, make sure. So um, we're about a two-year-old company. Um, we were started by um, myself and two other folks, uh, primarily a gentleman by the name of Michael Skelly. He was one of the founders of Horizon Wind. Um, they started in the uh, late 90s trying to build renewable facilities around the U.S., big wind farms, actually small wind farms back then, but um, over the last decade they've con grown considerably. Um, he left Horizon after they were sold to Goldman Sachs and, and then uh, EDP um, and wanted to find a new challenge. He ran for Congress and lost in a heavily Republican district. He's a Democrat, and uh, I'm the Republican part of that team. And uh, after that, he decided that uh, how are we going to uh, really integrate the best renewables in the country into the resource mix of utilities? And uh, so we got our heads together and we put together a business plan um, uh, that solely focuses on high voltage DC transmission lines as opposed to AC transmission lines. And uh, I'll give you a, kind of a broad uh, overview of what we're trying to do. Um, like I said, we only focus on DC lines. Uh, we've got a great team of about 40 people. Um, you might think that that uh, is dwarfed by the development and transmission offices and utilities, and it is. It's very small, but we are very focused. We have teams that are set up similar to how an independent power producer would, specific project teams, and then we have a finance team and an uh, engineering team and a legal team and, and so forth that, that crosses um, all of the projects. They're all at different stages, um, but we'll show you those. So um, this is the issue that we think in a, in a non-regulated manner that we can solve, which is, excuse me, this is the best wind in the country right here in purple. Um, this is the high voltage transmission system and you can see that there is no transmission to speak of where this wind is. So the question is how do you solve that problem? It is a problem waiting for a solution to happen. Uh, one that if can be done in an economic fashion can actually you know, provide real benefits, um, low cost power to, uh, to energy users. Um, and uh, and clean up the environment in a free market manner as well. Um, we've chosen in our business model to do direct current transmission lines for a handful of reasons. There are a few of them that I've outlined up here. Um, first of all, when you're trying to span that long distance, um, alternating current lines um, have lots of losses. That number is staggering. So if you move uh, a lot of power a long distance, the best way to do that is with direct current lines. Um, part of kind of our thesis is if you can get the best, most cost-effective wind and move it in the most cost-effective manner, then you can have a product on the end that's, that's low cost cost that load serving entities would like to buy in the end. Um, this shows the right of way issues. Um, transmission is never easy to build, but a, uh, if you're going to move 3,000 megawatts of power on the AC system, you need a right of way that could be five or 600 feet wide. Uh, with a DC line, you need about 125 to 150 feet. And that's all dependent upon the tower height, but you know, just say between 150 and 175 feet uh, at the upper end, uh, it is a very um, good use of rights of way to move that much power over a long distance over that small right of way.
Um, there's improved reliability. You can send power both ways if you need to. Um, you can dial up, um, and specifically, the AC grid, you know, it flows the path of least resistance. Electrons just go where, where there's uh, least resistance. In DC, we can turn up and turn down the line and determine how many megawatts flow across that line at any time. So there are actually reliability benefits on both ends of the line. DC technology is used all over the world. It's gotten uh, lots of uh, improvements over the last decade since the Chinese are involved. They're building 21 DC transmission lines today as we speak to move both coal and wind uh, to their load centers. Um, they are um, pushing ABB and Siemens um, to you know, kind of these new frontiers of technology in, in DC. And the commercial structure is really simple. This was uh, what, uh, it, it's like a pipeline. Um, a DC line, you have one converter station at one end of the line and one converter station at the other end of the line. And the power is generated at DC. It's converted at AC at the wind farms. We convert it back to DC and we move it DC and then convert it back to AC. Um, so we fly over states. This is not like a distribution line where there are uh, substations where you can put power on along the way. We are not trying to compete with underlying utilities. So that makes our regulatory process a little bit easier. If we had suggested we were going to move power from Oklahoma to Tennessee, we would cause at least four utilities, uh, independent, uh, I'm sorry, investor-owned utilities, and we would interact with their system. And that is not the goal of the company. We're trying to do something very different. So we want those folks to, uh, to buy wind power in their resource regions, and we want them to serve their load. But that's not our business, and that's not our business model. Um, this was a, I, I give you this uh, map. This was uh, put together by the Joint Coordinated System Planning effort um, led by the Midwest System Operator, CERC, the regional area down here. Um, and uh, there are a lot of planning entities in the Eastern Interconnect. They were all part of this. This was basically a hypothetical that said, if we were going to move to 20% wind in this country uh, by 2020, what would need to be done? And as you can see, all these black lines are DC lines. Um, hypothetically, the goal here was to figure out what's the most efficient and cost-effective way to move wind power, again, that's in the center of the country, to the load-serving entities over on the eastern part of the, the United States. Um, this, uh, the colored lines are AC lines. Those are basically high-voltage collector systems. Um, now, you might think this, all of this costs a lot of money, and it does. Uh, it would cost billions. It would cost tens of billions of dollars. But the thing that you all must remember on, uh, when it comes to an electricity bill, transmission is about 10% of your cost. If you can get competition in the generation portion of your bill, which is about 80%, and not necessarily competition, just competitive forces that keep that price down, then what you will be able to do is save a lot of money on the bills. You'll be able to keep those prices down. But 10 or $20 billion worth of transmission or $50 billion worth of transmission spread across uh, uh, a lot of different people um, means a very little bit for, uh, for, for each person. So technically, um, this program, this study showed that it actually can happen, that it's cost effective to happen, um, and that, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Our lines go from here to Tennessee. We don't go all the way down to Atlanta. We have a line that goes from Spearville, Kansas, to southern Missouri right here. We have one that goes from uh, Iowa right here to south of Chicago. So uh, these are the hardest states to get through right here, as you can imagine. So I think it's pretty unlikely that you're going to build all those lines. So it's really the best interest of the incumbent utilities to upgrade their system uh, kind of in that region. Um, I'll get off my uh, clean line for a second. Transmission is an area that has been uh, neglected for a long time um, because primarily it's really hard to build. Um, it is, uh, you know, there's NIMBYs out there. People do not like looking at transmission lines. Um, there is not a federal regime for siting transmission lines like there is natural gas pipelines, which makes it very hard and makes it very unlikely that utilities will build from one state to another. Um, lucky for us, when we went out and raised money, we got uh, a, a single 
Primarily, our investors are a single private equity firm based in New York. Uh, they're a family-run firm. Um, they manage lots and lots and lots of money. Um, and we are one of their energy investments. And their horizon is very long. So our, our capital that we're using today doesn't have to have a return for five or 10 years. Um, if you want to start up another firm like ours and you go to, you know, say Goldman Sachs or one of the other companies that manages private equity, a lot of times they have much shorter time horizons for returns of their money. And, and that creates a problem for this model. Uh, with a regulatory permitting process that is multi-years, um, to get money from a firm that uh, may have to return money, uh, principal plus, plus return in three or four years, uh, that's, that's a pretty tough call for, for them to, uh, or business for them to get in. So we have four projects. I, I think I told you where they are. They all have kind of railroad names. Uh, this is northeastern New Mexico to southern California, uh, Panhandle, Oklahoma to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Spearville, Kansas to St. Francis, um, substation in Missouri. Um, this is in the Midwest ISO region. We have northeastern Iowa to Chica south of Chicago to Joliet, which is in the PJM region. So um, the difference here is we've got um, the, uh, well, for each, this is called the resource side. This is the interconnection side. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different entities to deal with. And it's a big, big challenge. Um, but uh, we think with the long-term development, we can actually, we can get there. So specifically, since this is the southeast, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Plains and Eastern Clean Line. This resource area, and actually the, the, uh, the resource area is a little bit smaller. If you think uh, about 100 miles by 100 miles, uh, right in this area, there are uh, over 20,000 megawatts in the Southwest Power Pool queue. There are generating wind farms. There are wind farms that would like to be interconnected to the system to the tune of about 20,000 megawatts. This line of ours, uh, this, this would be two lines. So cut this in half. So say 3,500 megawatts, uh, which is a huge amount of power. But that's just a small blip in the radar screen as to the amount of megawatts that could be produced out there. It is windy all the time. It is a resource that folks on the ground out there would like to capture. They're farmers. Uh, they have irrigation systems. They have pump jacks for oil and gas development. They know that infrastructure development means revenue to them. Um, this would be about a 600 kV line. Um, again, about probably a 150 foot tower with one arm on each side, and that's it. So this is not a. It could be a lattice tower, but primarily they'll be monopole towers. Um, they're not the big, huge lattice structures. Um, a lot of that will be determined by cost of steel at the time. Um, but again, it will only have two pole or two lines, one down each side. Um, it won't have. Uh, it doesn't need any more than that. 800 miles. Uh, it's a long way for a transmission line, but it's not that long for uh, for pipelines. Uh, for railroads, for other linear infrastructures that we use to move our goods and services throughout the United States. Also in China, they're building 1,200 miles, 1,500 miles, so it works. Um, so the utilization rate, we expect to be above 50%. Um, the reason why this is important is the higher the utilization rate, the lower cost of the tariff for this transmission line. The wind out in this region um, the, re the reason historically wind has cost so much is it's a large capital expenditure, and you only recover that maybe 30 or 40 percent of the time when, you, when the wind's blowing. In this resource region, again, right in here, the wind is blowing almost all the time. Um, so you can raise the utilizations of the facilities, uh, and, and in a geographic dispersion model, we can see that in the top end of the resource area, the wind is blowing when the bottom is not and vice versa. So we kind of have a steady flow of wind throughout the entire uh, 24 hours of the day. This raises the, the utilization of the line. Um, this is about average for DC lines, um, but uh, we think we can get above that. Uh, three and a half billion, probably cut that in half for, uh, for a uh, for 3,500 megawatts. It's still very expensive. How can a company with 40 people 
expect to build a three and a half billion dollar line or a two billion dollar line. Um, well, the same way a utility does, quite frankly. Once you have regulatory certainty, um, like I said, the, the, the development capital is the hardest to come by. But once you have regulatory certainty, money is easy to come by. So once we get right of, a right of way and a permit and sell capacity on the line, which the line will not be built until then, um, money will come in the door quite easily. Um, cut these numbers in half also. In this day and age uh, of politics, it's about jobs. Um, there are a lot of jobs associated with this. These numbers are not just our jobs, um, because what we will do is we'll, f right now, uh, we'll, we'll, let me finish that sentence, we'll facilitate about 4,000 megawatts of wind production in this region. In Texas, between here and this whole region, there are 10,000 megawatts of wind in Texas. There are a couple thousand megawatts up here in Kansas. In Oklahoma, in this area, a couple hundred. That's it. It's because they haven't had transmission up there. In fact, I think the first wind farm in the Panhandle was just completed uh, a couple months ago. Um, if they can get transmission, they can, they can get their really good resource uh, to areas that need it. Um, so uh, the biggest issue on building transmission lines, as with any other linear, linear infrastructure, is permits. How are you going to get this right away? How are you going to get eminent domain? I mean, that's just, it's, it's the boogeyman in the room every time you talk to people. Uh, if I'm a landowner, I don't like it. Um, especially in, the, in uh, you know, areas where, in, in farming and ranching, where many of these properties have been in, uh, in families for generations. It's really hard. Um, the way to do that is to become a utility. You become a utility in the states. Um, it doesn't happen very often. In fact, most of the state laws were written at a time when they only expected to have one public utility in the state. Um, some of them are gray enough that we think we can fit through that, uh, that little hole. Um, we filed in Oklahoma and Arkansas, and we filed in some of the other states. Um, we, will, uh, we were denied in Arkansas initially because they said we didn't serve customers. And they said, we understand this is kind of circular, so how can you serve customers if you're not a public utility, and how can you become a public utility if you don't serve customers? They recognize this, but um, they've given us some roadmaps on, on how to become a utility. There's also another uh, a small provision in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which allows companies like ours to partner with the power marketing administrations. You have one down here called SEPA, the Southeastern Power Administration, although they don't own transmission anymore. There are two others in the United States, the Southwestern Power Administration and Western Area. And we modeled this after a structure that we, uh, we fixed a transmission bottleneck in California in the uh, early part of the decade. And the, the Power Marketing Administration uses all of their uh, siting authority. They use their um, uh, development expertise, and we basically give them the money and we form this partnership. And at the end, what you do is you split the capacity. Um, we get the, the majority of the capacity, they get some of the capacity on the line and generate revenues for, the, for their project. Um, you'll get this, this presentation. So I think those are the two biggest issues on, uh, on siting um, uh, uh, transmission lines. It's, or the biggest issue is how do you get uh, right of way. It is not capital. You go to Washington all the time and they'll say, we can work with you, but how much money do you need? This industry has plenty of money. They just need regulatory certainty. Um, I won't do too much of this, but uh, uh, the point here, it, oop, wrong one. The point here is uh, projects take a long time. You know, on some of our projects, 2016 may be ambitious. Um, uh, so uh, as we've started here, we actually started in 2009, we're in 2011, we've got a lot of, lot of regulatory work to do, um, begin the land acquisition, land acquisition takes about 18 months, construction takes about two years. Um, if you're a wind farm, now we're not developing the wind farms, but if you're a wind farm, uh, you're going to start your process kind of in the 2014 time frame because you want your project to come online when our project comes online. Uh, so why do we think wind is getting better? Well, w this, is a, this shows California um, when they put up wind turbines 20 years ago. Uh, very small, very inefficient, um, just 
you know, this is called an Altamont Pass. It was one of the, it's still one of the largest wind farms, 4,000 turbines. Um, but we've gone for, and, and each one, each one of these little turbines is uh, tiny. Um, these are two megawatt turbines uh, getting bigger to three megawatts. Um, these things are getting more efficient. They're getting taller. These blades are getting longer. And when you have longer blades and taller towers, you generate more energy for the same amount of capital cost which makes it more efficient. It makes it a better business decision. And that's how the price of power is coming down for wind. So how do, com how do I compare that to other renewables around the country and other resources? So this is what we're saying, you know, 35 a megawatt hour. Um, it's actually lower than that. There was a recent PPA that uh, was signed in the region for less than $30 a megawatt hour. Um, and so the, the whole story goes, thirty. Oh, I think another slide on the whole story, but let me compare. $30 a megawatt hour in this really rich resource area. Solar, $150 a megawatt hour. California wind, 95. Uh, Ohio wind, 85. 80. Offshore, I know there's been discussion here of offshore. Um, offshore, this is offshore in the northeast. Offshore down here is pretty expensive as well. I, I don't think there's really a number out there yet. Um, it won't be 250 likely, but it, 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 uh, it won't be 85 either. Um, and, uh, and biomass um, is about 80. So when you add our, this wind at 30 and our transmission line at 30, you get into Memphis at about $60 a megawatt hour. And if you wheel across the TVA system, it costs about 4 or $5 there. You can get into the Southern system, the Progress system, the Duke system, or any of the munis in that area for about $65 a megawatt hour. Now, if you compare that to a fully depreciated plant today, it's really expensive. If you compare that to building a new coal plant, building a new nuclear plant, which I think is an important thing for this country to do. Uh, if you think about, uh, if you compare apples to apples, then it's really a, it's a, it's a pretty good uh, economic uh, equation here. The one other thing, um, I think I have it on, yeah, here, I'll get to that. Let me do this slide first, because uh, this is what really compares the numbers. Um, so, th so everybody's with this, uh, with all the shale gas that's being produced, everybody is, they call it the, you know, rush to gas. But combined cycle plants cost, capital costs are pretty small. You know, they run a lot. They're, you can cycle them, you can turn them on and turn them off, and they're a very good part of the system. But they have this variable part of it, which is the, the cost of gas. The cost of fuel changes all the time. And uh, if you're, in, the Southeast has a lot of idle capacity in the natural gas fleet. Um, companies like Calpine and Williams and Duke and others built a bunch of plants down here that are not doing much today. So you can, get, you can probably get them for actually cheaper than this. But this is a market price. So if you're going to move towards a huge fleet of combined cycle, what you might want to think about is having something, something like a $50 or $60 flat rate wind price that goes with it. It's a natural hedge. Because when you sign a PPA for wind, it will be that rate for 20 years because there's no fuel charge. So you're basically paying for the capital cost and then maybe a little wheeling charge and that's it. So it's a, it's a pretty good, it's a good argument. It's a good discussion item to have. It may not be, uh, you know, the, uh, the answer to all of the questions, but it could be part of one. Uh, Y'all will get this in, uh, in the presentation, but again, this is just, this is how the price breaks out. If you think $30, generally speaking, we've seen $29, but a $30 purchase power agreement price, the tariff, the losses, uh, we can, if you really want to get technical, I can tell you what these are, but you add them all up and that's the transmission cost. Um, you know, you're talking in the mid-50s, $50, um, $50 delivered power to Memphis, and then $5 beyond that. So um, again, uh, we could go through these numbers a little bit more specific. This is another, the other line that we have, the Grain Belt line, which goes into St. Francis Substation in Missouri. Um, so the shorter the line, you know, a little bit less of a price. Um, uh, the one big issue, uh, everybody thinks wind is too expensive, and God forbid, how are we going to integrate this stuff? It only blows at night. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work on integration. 
Um, first of all, if you try to integrate one or two wind farms, it is very hard. If you try to integrate, um, well, one, one or two wind farms is pretty easy. Ten wind farms is hard. Um, Twenty or thirty wind farms, it actually gets easier because that's where you have the geographic dispersion and wind blows in one area of the resource region when it's not blowing in the other. And what this does is it creates a much straighter curve on how much, the wind, how much wind is blowing how much of the time. Now you would think that utilities would mostly be nervous about drop-offs in wind, when wind stops very quickly. But in fact, that's not the case. They are concerned when wind ramps up very quickly. Because most of the utilities in the east have nuclear and coal plants. If they get a big ramp up in wind, what do they do with their generation? Um, so luckily for, for wind turbines, you can bevel the blades and you can manage the up ramp very easily. If it was the drop off, what you need is that you need to have spinning reserves. You need to have ancillary services well, which will help pick up and support the system until the, uh, to ensure that the system stays in balance. Um, we did this study with TVA data. So take scenario two. 3,500 megawatts of, of wind delivered to TVA. Um, we used real wind data from the resource area. We used real hourly load data from TVA. Um, this will actually get sh smaller a number as you get to 10 minute data. But um, it shows that you need 332 megawatts of basically spinning reserves or ancillary services in the market ready to pick up if there is a major event, a downward major event in wind. So um, ANGA, the natural gas folks put out a study a couple months ago that basically said you need a megawatt of gas for a megawatt of wind. Um, that's all hypothetical. You have to look at the real data. And I'll tell you why. Because wind is variable, but so is load. If you look at the variability of wind with static load, it's a, it's a problem. But load is as variable as wind is. So you have to look at how they work together. I'll go through these real quick. I have two slides. Uh, economics are great for a project like this. Public acceptance is good. Lots of money, technology, adequate wind. FERC is supportive of it. If you want delivered wind, DC lines are the way to go. Um, our challenges. Um, Siding, state siding laws, no federal siding laws. Who knows if they'll ever have the spine to fix this, but it should be fixed. It would make it much more efficient. Uh, the president talks about uh, lots of renewables, but I don't think anybody else in his administration is listening. Uh, and they uh, have no clue of what the prices are, quite frankly. They don't know how much the prices come down. Uh, just interconnecting DC lines is something that uh, hasn't been done very often here. I say the incumbent sandboxes. Um, you know, historically incumbents don't like them serving their load or coming into their area. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a give and take. It's, uh, uh, it's something we expect. It's something that uh, we think ultimately will be partners with utilities um, over time. Uh, integration, which we just went through, uh, lack of motivation by DOE. Um, you know, they and the administration could, can be talking about these positive things, um, that wind can be reliably delivered at a very inexpensive price, um, as opposed to a heavy-handed mandate, you have to do this. Um, I think more companies, more utilities, would actually go out and buy wind. They'd go buy wind farms um, because they can get the capital costs recovered. Um, if you think about rate of re uh, recovery for a, uh, an electric utility, um, they make no return on the fuel charge, but they make a pretty hefty or a pretty decent return on their capital costs. Uh, if you think about that in a gas plant, that example up there, $15. We'll just say a 250 megawatt gas plant is $250 million. Uh, that's what they'll get return on an invested capital. For wind, it's about $400 million for 250 megawatts of wind. And you can invest that and get a return on, on a higher piece of equity. So um, I think it's something that you're seeing. You're seeing Midwestern utilities buy more and more. Uh, it's much more cost effective than buying renewable energy credits, which would have been mandated or a way to comply with a federal RPS. Um, so in closing, I want you all to take away that the price of wind is coming down, that some of this can be done in a free market way. It doesn't have to be you know, the government mandating what needs to be done. And that there are models out there, like ours, and there are others, 
that, uh, that can help facilitate and move this debate forward, again, in a free market way, um, one where uh, utilities, uh, folks like us can make money and drive a, uh, a product uh, to market that, uh, that is wanted and needed and will improve the environment. So thank you all very much. I'm sorry if that was a little long. I don't know how to change that. Sorry, we had um, some technology issues there, hopefully not wardrobe malfunctions. Um, so, um, I, um, as, as Dorothy mentioned, um, I'm Dan Frank, I'm with uh, Sutherland, I'm from our Washington, D.C. office, so I, I'm cognizant of the fact that um, I have two strikes against me coming in here because I'm a lawyer and I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, happily, I didn't bring my tasseled loafers, so that would have been a third strike against me. Um, I, I am a lawyer, so I have to do the, the normal disclaimers. Um, you know, these are my opinions only, not of the firm, our clients, or, or my family. Um, but my goal here today is to talk about a little bit about um, the regulatory environment in which um, projects like uh, Jimmy's and Clean Line Energy and others who are trying to bring um, wind from uh, the air, wind and other renewable resources from the areas where they're located to the load centers. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about. Um, FERC, so you all understand, you know who FERC is and what they do, what their authority is, what some of um, uh, what some of the things that FERC is doing to promote the development of transmission to get those re resources to the load centers, uh, what some of the challenges they're facing. In particular, we'll talk a little bit about, little bit about planning and cost allocation issues, and then very end, we'll touch upon um, some of the reliability issues. Um, so FERC is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It's, it's the main player, uh, as far as federal regulation goes, in this space. Um, it's an independent federal agency. Um, traditionally or historically, FERC has been concerned with rate regulation of what you might think of as tr traditional public utilities, investor-owned utilities like uh, Georgia Power Company here in the southeast. Um, more recently, uh, FERC has been involved in regulating or promoting uh, the development of competitive wholesale electricity markets. FERC also regulates natural gas pipelines and to some extent oil pipelines. We'll, we'll just talk about electricity today, of course. Um, FERC's main mission as far as its, it, you know, its statutory mandate it, it goes is to ensure that the rates, terms, and conditions of jurisdictional services are just and reasonable and not unduly discriminatory. Here we'll focus mostly on uh, transmission of electric energy and interstate commerce. Um, you know, think about the extent of FERC's jurisdiction here. You know, virtually everything outside of Texas is in interstate commerce other than Alaska and Hawaii. Um, Texas is a sort of its own island because there's so few interconnections between Texas and most of Texas and the rest of the interconnected electrical grid in the United States. So carve off Texas, but it, basically everything is in interstate commerce, even a line, a transmission line that's located solely within one state but has interconnections with the rest of the interconnected grid. It's all interstate commerce, and FERC touches upon it. Um, FERC doesn't have jurisdiction over local distribution, you know, the, the, the lines and poles that go to uh, homes and businesses and things like that. So it's fairly extensive. So that's, that's why th this is the player we're dealing with. Um, the big problem, of course, that FERC is facing is what to do with um, the anticipated uh, development of massive quantities of renewable generation um, in those areas that are far from the load centers. Um, remember Jimmy's map where he had showed the wind in the middle states, uh, but the load centers off to the west and to the east. You've got to figure out how to get the transmission built to get it from the middle states out to the sides. Um, but you also have to do it in a way to ensure continued reliable operation of the transmission system. Um, this is complicated for FERC for a number of reasons, um, one of which, as Jimmy alluded to, um, there's no, virtually no federal siting authority. There's one exception I'll touch upon in a little bit later, um, but given relatively recent developments, I mean, it's what siting authority FERC may have in this area really is, is amounts to nil. Um, the courts also in recent times have been telling FERC, um, you really need to make sure that the, the cost that you try and allocate uh, through your rate setting authority has to match up with the benefits uh, that people are receiving or not receiving. Um, 
roughly commensurate, I think, is actually FERC's uh, way of describing the relationship between costs that it seeks to impose on others um, and the benefits. Uh, but it's, it's really a pretty apt description of what the courts were telling FERC. So what has FERC been doing in the area of promoting transmission development? Um, on the, the rate regulated side of things, so it, for, as far as this slide goes, think of traditional cost of service based uh, regulation. Um, so FERC's going to take a look at the cost, you know, uh, you know, approve or modify what the, the public utilities are charging for transmission. Um, through a provision that was adopted in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, by the way, if I slip into um, lawyer speak and say EPAC 05, that's what I'm talking about. Um, FERC is required uh, to encourage the development of transmission through rate incentives. And by rate incentives, we mean things like uh, increasing the return on equity, or ROE, that regulated utilities are able to uh, collect or seek and have an opportunity to collect through their regulated rates. Uh, so for example, if uh, the regulated rate of return that a utility might, may get would be 10%, if you add 1% or 2% on that to boost it up to 11 or 12%, um, that's an incentive. It, it gives the utility an incentive to put more money into that area because it can collect a higher return. Um, there are other incentives include recovery of certain types of costs that might otherwise not be collected, or there's more of a guarantee of a collection of those costs, like um, if the cost of a project that is abandoned, well, if there are costs associated with the project that ultimately is abandoned by the utility, in certain, cer certain circumstances, if the utility gets this rate incentive, they're able to collect the cost of the abandoned project. Um, that encourages the utility to go ahead and devote the resources to the transmission project, uh, whereas if it didn't have that incentive, it might otherwise do it. Uh, the goal, of course, is uh, to attract investment to transmission to get it built so we can get the renewable resources to load. Um, it's also encouraged new technologies, so if you're you know, boosting the return that utilities can get, they may look more favorably at these uh, uh, technologies. Um, recent questions have arisen as to whether the regime that FERC has put in place to um, adopt these rate incentives, uh, in particular, a little bit of background here, the developer to get a rate incentive has to show uh, for a particular project that um, there are reliability and or economic benefits resulting from reduced congestion as a result of the transmission project. Um, a rebuttable presumption is created uh, for meeting this, this requirement if the project is approved by a state commission or through a regional transmission planning process. Um, the developer also has to show a nexus between the incentive and the particular project. You know, I need a higher rate of return or higher return on equity uh, before I invest in the project because it's very risky, something like that. Well, a question has, has been arisen that is FERC approving too many of these things too quickly? Uh, the concern is, uh, for example, if a utility is planning on developing transmission just through the normal course of business, you know, they have an obligation to serve uh, n their native load, their, their retail rate payers, they're going to be upgrading and expanding the transmission system just as the load grows over time or as they add new generation resources over time just through maintenance, you know, to replace transmission wear and tear. If they're already going to be building that transmission, do you really need to throw incentives at them? That's just gilding the lily and making consumers pay more. So there's been some questions raised about whether this threshold has been set too low and FERC is approving too much. So on the, on the other side of the ledger are merchant transmission projects. Um, the distinction between merchant transmission and traditional rate regulated uh, transmission projects, think of it this way, you know, the traditional utility model is that the utility has a, an exclusive franchise service territory. It's the sole supplier to consumers in that territory. Um, they are captive customers and the regulatory compact is that if the utility invests in, in infrastructure, they'll have an opportunity to recover those costs from the captive rate payers. A merchant transmission project like Clean Line Energy does not have captive rate payers. They're going to assume all the risks um, from putting in the money and the capital to developing the project. So they can't turn to somebody who can't go anywhere else. Um, they have to do a good job to get uh, the investment. Uh, here's my example. Is, this is actually, <laughs> I developed the slide without talking to Jimmy first. This is his project. So he's, he's the, uh, the poster boy, I guess, if you will, for a um, uh, merchant project. Um, FERC can grant negotiated rate authority for merchant projects. They have to meet certain criteria, of course, um, but it's, it's different than the traditional cost of service based rates where the utility comes into FERC, opens up a books and says, these are my costs, this is what I think the rate should be based on those costs. Merchant projects can negotiate the rate with their, cons their customers. It's not unregulated 
projects, of course, un unregulated rates, FERC still has a role to play with respect to the merchant projects um, and the negotiated rates. FERC will want to make sure that the open season that the, the developer uses to attract customers is done in a fair, transparent, and open basis so that um, all customers have a shot at getting on the line. Um, it's negotiated rate authority, but it's, recall it's interstate transmission, so FERC still has the statutory mandate to ensure that rates, terms, conditions of service are just and reasonable and not unduly discriminatory. Uh, in particular, FERC's going to take a look at whether there's any undue preferences given to affiliates of the project developer. Um, and FERC also wants to see that operational control of the transmission project is turned over at some point or in some way to an independent grid operator. And again, that's just to ensure fairness and openness. Um, one of the areas that, that's uh, gained uh, you know, quite a bit of attention recently at FERC is priority rights to the transmission that's being um, developed to move the resources uh, from the middle states out to the, uh, to the load centers. And the way this is um, typically getting framed nowadays is the incumbent transmission providers, think of you know, traditional utilities, versus the non-incumbents or the independent and merchant developers. Um, some of the issues that have come up is that under the traditional model, a transmission provider is going to be operating under FERC's standardized or pro forma open access transmission tariff. And here's lawyer speak, OATT or OAT. Um, the merchant developers have made the case that a lot of the provisions of the standardized OATT really don't apply, and they need actually additional flexibility to be able to attract the financing that, that they need to bring their project to, to fruition. Um, and so the question is raised, well, can you have two different sets of rules, one for the incumbents and one for the, the non-incumbents? Um, you know, I, I think a good case can be made that uh, if they're not under two entirely different sets of rules, at least some of them can be waived or modified for the merchant projects. Um, what is the role of anchor customers, you know, the, sort of the anchor tenants, the guys who first come in and provide the needed contracts that will support the financing for the projects? Um, under the traditional OATT model, service on a transmission line or on the transmission system is done on a first-come, first-served basis. Well, with the anchor customers, that may not work appropriately. You want to guarantee them priority rights to the transmission because it's their funding or their backing that's going to allow the project to be built. So you want to make sure that you know, if they sign a, a long-term agreement with the, the project developer, they're going to be able to get on the line and move the resource um, from source to load. Um, I'll skip ahead a little bit and skip over the others. Um, special cases that have come up in connection with priority rights to transmission. Generator lead lines. Uh, FERC has issued a number of uh, orders in this area. What a generator lead line is really is just a um, a high voltage large transmission line that connects the generation resource to the transmission system. Well, in some cases, the genera generator, well, typically the generator will size the transmission line or the, the interconnection line to the scope of the project. They're the, one who's, they're the ones who are going to own it, they're going to use it, it's going to move their generation from the generators to the transmission system. Well, if you've got a larger uh, generation project that's built in or phased in over time, uh, the generator may build a transmission line, an interconnection line, that's oversized. It's much larger than the generation project is at the outset. And the question arises, well, who gets to use the excess capacity on that line? And FERC has said, well, if the generator has um, specific plans to develop its, its generation project and with milestones, specific milestones and construction dates, the generator uh, has priority use to the excess capacity when this project comes online. Until that time, it has to allow third parties to use the transmission line that it builds, but when its project does come to fruition, it has access to that line. That encourages the generator to go ahead and size its line in a way that it think uh, makes the most amount of sense to bring its generation project to market. Um, participant funded expansions apply really in, in sort of the traditional cost of service model. Um, you think about just, this is really just traditional uh, FERC uh, regulation here where um, a customer can seek transmission service on you know, cost of service uh, traditional utility lines uh, on a participant funded basis. So the, the customer comes to the utility and says, I'd like you to expand the system to accommodate my project. I want to move my power across your system. Go ahead and expand it. I'll pay for it. Um, in that case, FERC said it's perfectly fine for the customer to get priority access to the expansion of the transmission system. Um, and this is all sort of an ongoing inquiry at FERC. Got the docket number there for those who are interested in looking it up. Looking it up. So on the planning and, and uh, cost allocation front, um, which has really uh, captured FERC's attention and is a high priority for FERC these days, um, under the existing model right now, each uh, 
sorry, RTO, regional transmission organization, these are the independent grid operators, um, and transmission provider, you know, like your traditional uh, uh, regulated utilities. Each of them has a, a is, in t is supposed to have a planning process that's open, fair, and, uh, and transparent. It's supposed to allow you know the customers to come in, everybody who has an interest to get together and figure out what are we going to develop as far as transmission goes. Um, those have been in place roughly since 2007 when Order 890 was, was issued by FERC. Um, we've had a couple years experience with those tra transmission planning processes and FERC has determined that um, improvements are required. Um, in a rulemaking initiated uh, a year or so ago, um, followed by a proposal in June of last year, FERC um, made several findings with respect to how well those uh, planning processes were working and found them deficient. Uh, for one, uh, they're characterized by a lack of regional planning uh, as far as requirement goes. So the processes are in place, but FERC really wants um, the industry to look at uh, transmission planning on a regional basis and to make it a requirement uh, as opposed to just doing it through studies. Um, there's also, FERC found there's also a lack of inter-regional coordination, um, so coordination between the regions. If you think back to the map that Jimmy had where he showed uh, the source, the resource side of uh, the line was in Oklahoma, but the sink or the load was in Tennessee. You've crossed two different regions right there, at least two. Um, you want those regions to coordinate about um, what's going to be built and how are the costs going to be allocated between the regions and the utilities and consumers in those regions. Uh, there's been a failure to account for transmission needs driven by public policy requirements. And really what we mean here by public policy requirements are state mandated uh, uh, resource, uh, port, I'm sorry, renewable portfolio standards, RPS. Um, you've got to have 20% of your, your energy um, uh, come through renewable resources by 2020. That's you know, sort of the typical. California, I think, is what, up to 30, 33%. Um, so in the planning process, you really want it to account, what FERC wants um, utilities to do is to account for the transmission that may be required uh, to meet utilities' plans to satisfy their RPS requirements. And then finally, um, one of the deficiencies is the right of first refusal that traditional utilities have under FERC's open access transmission tariff um, to build transmission projects. It really shuts out the non-incumbents, uh, the merchant generator or merchant transmission developers of the world. Um, Cost allocation uh, requirements also were found to be uh, deficient. A major concern is retail ratepayers being obligated to fund transmission to move the renewables from the middle states out to the sides. Um, if you think about the states that are sort of the, the transit states from Oklahoma all, all the way over to Tennessee, well, under the traditional cost allocation methodology, there's a concern that each of the, the utilities along the path would have an obligation to fund um, and this is outside the, the merchant development model, have an obligation to fund the development of the transmission. But are they really getting any benefit from that? So if you build the transmission in Oklahoma, for example, to get it out of state, and the consumers in that state have to pay, have they really benefited from it? it maybe sort of in, in a global sense from the, the wind that gets de the wind generation that gets developed, but they're on the hook for the transmission. And their concern is that, well, that's not fair. Even if it is only 10% of the transmission bill, it still can be significant. Um, Three and a half billion dollars seems, <laughs> seems large to me, right? Um, at the other extreme, though, if you want to avoid saddling those consumers with those costs, you could say, well, we'll make the generation developer pay. But you know, the concern with that is that the costs are so significant that it may just inhibit the development of the transmission and you just killed the project altogether. Um, there's also a lack of a link between the transmission planning process and cost allocation issues. And really what the concern here is that um, if a transmission project is going through the planning process, it looks like it's going to be built and all that, and then you inject cost allocation concerns at the very end, um, everybody finds out what they have to pay to get this transmission project uh, built, the developer may just pull out and say, I can't afford that, the project's killed. Well, everybody else that was behind that project, that was depending upon that project getting built, all of a sudden has to refigure out, what are we going to do? Um, there's cost with the additional studies involved as a result of that, but more importantly is the delay um, in time caused by the ha having to restudy. So FERC's solution um, was a proposed rule issued in June of 2010, still pending um, at FERC, so it's not a final rule yet, but what FERC um, proposed, and these are the major elements, um, required e uh, each region is required to have a transmission planning process put together, not just studies, but actually come together as a region and figure out what the transmission plans are going to be. Um, each region must coordinate with neighboring regions and also consider the RPS requirements uh, for the states that are in the region. 
Uh, FERC proposed it to eliminate the right of uh, first refusal that incumbents have under the open access transmission tariff. Um, and then FERC says uh, there must be a cost allocation determination or methodology on a regional basis subject to various principles of cost allocation that uh, FERC has put forward. Um, again, you sort of have the uh, cost must be roughly commensurate with the benefits uh, received. You can't um, involuntarily allocate costs to those who have received no benefits um, from the project. Uh, the benefit to cost ratio must not be excessively high. I think what FERC has proposed is that the benefit to cost ratio can be no more than 1.25, which, you know, sort of in a rough sense, equates costs and benefits um, involved. Um, costs may, may not be allocated outside a region without consent. The allocation process must be transparent. Importantly, different allocation methodologies may be used for different types of projects. Uh, so I've listed here, you know, different types of projects. Reliability project, those are sort of the, the, the normal uh, course of business type investments that the utility is going to make to meet its load serving obligations. It may be appropriate to allocate those costs on a region-wide basis so that everybody pays because it's reliability, everybody benefits. Whereas transmission that's built to satisfy public policy goals, such as RPS requirements, maybe we have a different uh, allocation methodology for those types of transmission. Maybe some of that goes to, gets uplifted to the entire region, otherwise maybe uh, the bulk of the costs go to the load center. FERC didn't say what's the right answer, just said you need to deal with these uh, principles on a general basis. Um, we don't have time here. Another big proposal uh, by FERC in this area, uh, and this is from earlier this year, was its um, proposal to facilitate the development of wind and solar generation through integrating VERs, variable energy resources, really it's just wind and solar, although I think they really have wind in mind mostly. Um, three main proposals here. Uh, one is to allow intra-hour scheduling, so scheduling every 15 minutes. Um, that uh, puts the scheduling deadline more closer to real time when the wind developers or the wind generators have a better idea of what the wind will actually be doing. Um, you can't get right on top of real time because then the transmission operators don't have time to react. And so FERC said 15 minutes is, is pretty good. The wind generator will know roughly what the wind's going to be like in the next 15 minutes. They can put in a revised schedule as needed. That still gives sufficient time to the transmission operators to adjust as needed. The idea being that that will lower the cost of any imbalances between what was scheduled versus what the actual output from the wind resource is. Uh, lowers cost to the wind generator, so that helps develop uh, the wind resource. Um, but it also means the transmission operator is going to have to carry less reserves um, to make up for any shortfall or excess uh, that occurs in real time. So again, overall, the system costs go down, and that helps develop the resources. Uh, the renewable, or, sorry, the variable uh, generators would be required to share data on production forecasting with the transmission operators. I mean, there's some, some rules as far as when and how that has to happen, but that's generally what the idea is. Again, if that data is shared with the transmission operator, the transmission operator will have a better sense of what's going to be on the system at any given moment, and that'll help lower the overall system costs and, and the wind generator's share of those costs. Um, at the same time, FERC recognizes that Variable generators do impose um, certain costs on the system that dispatchable resources like coal or gas fire plants don't. And FERC uh, has been dealing with this on a case-by-case -case basis to date, but has come out now with this proposal and said it's appropriate to go ahead and, and come up with a generic rate schedule that transmission operators or you know, the traditional utilities can use uh, to charge the generators an appropriate share of the reserves um, that the utility has to have online uh, to make up for any differences between what's scheduled and what's actually on the system. You know, overall, it's really, this was, the proposal that FERC came out with was just tinkering at the edges, I think, um, you know, tinkering with the existing regime. Um, earlier in this proceeding, FERC had put out, you know, a whole series of proposals that were, you know, were, were fairly major in, in um, scope. For example, FERC asked whether it would be appropriate to require the consolidation of balancing authorities. Um, the bigger the balancing authority, the idea is, um, the better you can balance uh, the, the wind resources with the load uh, and reduce overall costs. So um, FERC shied away from that and went with the three narrowly uh, tailored proposals here. So it wasn't the game changer, but you know, I think it'll help. Um, you know, I might just, I, it has some stuff here on, on integrated resource plans or resource plans in general. I'll probably just skip over these so we keep going. I mean, the important point here is that, you know, in the Southeast, um, and I was saying the Southern Company's um, corporate responsibility report here, they wanted increased renewables. Um, Georgia 
power really. I mean, there wasn't, there's not much in the way of renewable resources planned for the southeast. Um, part of that just reflects, you know, geography. There's, there's not a whole lot of wind blowing, um, notwithstanding how windy it seems out there today. Uh, there's just not a lot of consistent wind like there is um, in Oklahoma and in the, in, in the middle states. Um, so, you know, what that points to is I, I don't think it's a lack of interest. It's more a fact of you've got to figure out a way to get the resource from where it is in the middle states to the southeast, and that's where you know, building the transmission comes into play. Um, here's the one citing example. So, you know, you might think, well, what can FERC, is there anything FERC can do more on this? Can FERC order the building of transmission? Um, and really, they cannot. The one exception um, is in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Congress did give FERC certain backstop uh, construction permit uh, authority in certain cases. Um, it's only in national interest electric transmission corridors where states lack authority or withhold approval for more than a year. Um, right now, there are only two designated uh, such corridors, and they have to be in areas where the DOE has found there's substantial congestion in transmission, and therefore it's appropriate to designate those areas to get FERC involved um, if all the requirements are met so that transmission can be built. Um, the one corridor is in the mid-Atlantic states, and the other is in the desert southwest. Um, however, um, some co court rulings to sort of really cut back on how effective uh, this backstop siting authority would be. Um, one is uh, 2009, might actually have been 2010, um, the court determined that FERC's interpretation of what withhold authority means uh, was incorrect. So, you know, the paradigm here is that um, a developer files for a permit with the states, you know, in Oklahoma, Arkansas, wherever, the state sits on it for more than a year. Well, the developer at that point can say, forget you, state, I'm going to the federal government, I'm going to get my, my signing authority from the feds. Well, um, FERC said withhold also means not just sitting on it for more than a year, but denying the permit. And the court said, no, no, withhold doesn't mean deny. So if the state just comes out right and denies the application uh, that the developer has uh, requested, that's the end of the game. It really does have to be a case where the state sits on it for too long. Um, a more recent court ruling out of California, the federal, government out, uh, federal court out of California, said that the Department of Energy, in determining what these two national interest electric transmission corridors are, didn't adequately consider states' views. So um, I'm not sure at this point where that's going, but these two rulings really have, um, I mean, FERC didn't have much authority here to begin with, but these two rulings have really cut back on it significantly. So, you know, I think it'd be at a high level uh, accurate to say this is, uh, FERC really doesn't have backstop siting authority or any at all. Uh, finally, I'll just say a few words about reliability in the high, high voltage uh, grid of the future. Um, this background, more, more acronyms from the lawyer from Washington. Um, NERC is the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, really has, it's, a, its main mission is to develop mandatory and enforceable reliability standards. So um, what do users, owners, and operators of the bulk power system, which is the high voltage transmission system, have to do to comply um, uh, to keep the system operating reliably? Um, NERC also conducts reliability assessments for the transmission grid to determine, you know, how, how, how are things operating reliably and what, what are the plans going forward. Um, in the southeast, the reliability entity is CERC. Uh, Jimmy referred to, uh, referenced them. Um, they're really the frontline enforcer of the reliability standards, so the owners and operators of the transmission system down here, CERC is the one uh, that they interface with on a regular basis. So it's CERC that does the compliance audits, the investigations, data requests, and the whole bit. Um, any penalties that CERC imposes on those who are regulated um, are subject to review and approval by NERC and then by FERC. So, and that's sort of the background on the, on the reliability regime. Um, the big issues, I guess I'd say, for, for the high voltage grid, big concern with what the potential impacts of decommissioning the large amounts of coal fire generation are. Um, this is in, in light of uh, concerns about increased regulation of uh, emissions and coal fire generation generally from, from uh, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, um, in light of the cost that would it cost, the cost involved with retrofitting coal fire plants or, you know, in, installing scrubbers or what have you on them are so great that um, 
the utilities may decide to decommission the coal plants rather than try and retrofit them and come into compliance with whatever EPA comes up with. Um, this may be potentially, you know, particularly pronounced in the southeast given the lack of um, renewable generation in the southeast. I mean, if you get rid of co the coal plants, you know, what are your options? There's nuclear, um, which has its own problems as far as getting those built uh, and finance. Um, gas fire generation, which, you know, easy to install, that's great, but uh, if the price of gas goes high and if everybody's using gas fire plants to replace coal fire plants, you can expect the gas, price of gas to go up. Um, so, you know, and, and in consi you know, consistent with the focus of this series on renewable energy, um, if you get rid of the coal or large amounts of coal in the southeast and you don't have the renewable energy to replace it, uh, you may have some problems. As far as reliability go, the reliability standards go, there are transmission planning requirements built into the reliability standards, but there's really not a mandate in them to build transmission to bring the renewable resources to load. So I don't think you can really look to the reliability regime uh, as an answer there. Some issues on the horizon. Um, deployment of smart grid infrastructure. Um, you know, most of the smart grid stuff is going to be uh, built on the local distribution side of things. So that's really outside of FERC's jurisdiction, though there are some costs that would could be recouped through FERC regulated rates. So FERC will have sort of a rate regulation uh, role there. Um, FERC also does has some authority with respect to setting standards for smart grid applications. Um, more to be seen on that, I guess, as, as things progress. Um, other new technologies on the transmission side that are within FERC's jurisdiction may come up, and FERC's got to figure out how to incorporate and regulate those. Um, a good example would be sort of like industrial size or commercial size batteries for energy storage. Um, FERC has actually just issued uh, a series of questions on this to explore this further, but one of the main questions is, what are those technologies? What is you know uh, battery for energy storage? Is it a replacement for transmission, and therefore should it be regulated like transmission? Um, is it more like the generation services that are required to maintain the reliability of the transmission system and therefore should be regulated like an those ancillary services? Or is it just another substitute for generation and therefore let the market forces decide how those should be priced? Um, and of course, you know, finally, is, you know, ever looming cybersecurity uh, threats, you know, whenever you build a high voltage transmission line, you know, it's going to be subject to the reliability regime um, that's in place now. Um, they would be subject to cyber attacks if they're brought down, if a big high voltage line is brought down, what are you going to do about that? Because the, the generation that's on the resource side would be lost. So that's sort of looming on the horizon. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have a time for questions. I'm happy there are questions out there. Uh, what else? that you ask your question in the microphone uh, so that it goes out over the webcast. So uh, let me just see just a second. Okay, who, uh, anyone have a question? Hi, I have two short questions. The first one is what Technologies should Georgia Tech be developing to help you guys do this kind of stuff? You know, is it like thyristors or inverters or, you know, special metal alloys? And then the second question is, I get the impression that, you know, the Obama administration and the U.S. government in general is trying to do the right thing, but only partially successfully. And I was wondering if you could comment on, like, what are the problems, the key problems that need to be fixed and sort of like, you know, what are your ideas about how that could happen? Why don't I take the first one and you take the second one? Um, if you think that, uh, I mean, I'll kind of focus on wind and DC transmission. Um, and I think some of that, uh, perhaps storage as well. But um, if you think wind is going to flourish in these states with a, that are traditionally constrained without transmission, then you look at the components within the turbines. Um, you look at the blades, you look at the towers, you look at all of those technologies that are there and improvements that are coming. There, are, I mean, for the last 15 years, there really hasn't been much technological improvement in turbines until the last two or, two or three years when they're going to direct 
direct drive turbines. They're, um, so they're trying to find ways to pull out costs, uh, reduce O&M costs, and make them more efficient and more powerful. So there are, um, uh, there are electrical pieces to that, as well as um, other pieces with blades, uh, the components within the turbine. Um, kind of on the system side, there are thyristors. There are all sorts, you know, a lot of that research is being done by kind of the, the big guys. At least that's where we see it. Uh, the Siemens and the, the ABB are the two primary providers of DC equipment, the conversion equipment. Um, because as you know, you know, developing something at a university is really, really important. And the problem is not getting it developed, it's developing it to scale and testing it on the system. So I would say that, um, you know, finding those partners where you can actually test them on the, test ideas on the system is really important. But um, I don't know if I've completely answered your question, but I hope I've given you a little bit of an idea. Okay, and I, I guess I'll handle the, the second question. Um, I, I think there are legislative fixes that are that are required, and, and the one that we talked about mostly um, is the lack of federal siting authority. Um, you know, there is a model for that on the natural gas pipeline side, so it's not as if FERC doesn't know what to do or Congress doesn't know know how to do it. Um, it's just a question of whether you know do they have the political will to go ahead and say, you know, we're going to give this authority to FERC and allow them to you know in some cases, I guess, run rushed over what the states think. But if the goal is to get this transmission de um, developed and siting is a concern, and you've got, um, I think Jimmy's slide was, was well put, antiquated siting, or an antiquated siting laws uh, within the states, you may just need federal le um, leadership in that regard, and it, it would require a statutory fix. Um, I don't know if the Obama administration is the one that's going to lead that. Um, FERC itself is an independent agency, so it's sort of in, in the headless fourth branch. Um, you know, the chairman is, is from the president's party, but, you know, he's not directly answerable necessarily to the president. So um, you, know, you really do need uh, the administration to, to step up in that. There are regulatory fixes that can be done. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the existing rulemakings that FERC has going on play out, in particular on the planning and cost allocation rulemaking. Now, that's been sitting at FERC since... Um, I mean, came out in June of 2010. Comments were submitted, so you know, hopefully, we'll see something soon on that. Um, but I'd say that looks promising as far as you know, getting the regions to the table. Everybody has a seat at the table. Figure out you know what needs to be built and who's going to pay for it. Let me, let me add just one other thing. Um, in Washington, you hear a lot that we don't have a national energy policy, um, and that may be true. But the fact of the matter is, energy is. Uh, is developed uh, and consumed pretty regionally. Um, and to develop a national model is very, very difficult. So um, obviously when you develop anything in Washington, you can have a new administration comes in that overturns it. I mean, I would argue that um, President Clinton, um, I don't know, two years into his term, he put out an energy policy. George Bush, within the first six months, put out an energy policy. But these weren't uh, blessed by Congress, they weren't. Uh, yeah, so, so, what is a national energy policy? Is is really the question? I think it's going to be driven by price and reliability over over the future. And all of those resources that are out there that want to play in that resource mix have to prove both reliably and on an economic fashion that they deserve to be there. Interesting question from one of our webcast participants along those lines. Uh, there was a discussion with Perbingaman and others about a national renewable energy standard. Uh, could you provide any insights into that RES discussion relative to transmission? If, if they, presumably if they exist. Well, I would say that um, any RES, or as it's, it's been called a renewable energy standard, standard or renewable portfolio standard, a clean energy standard, which might include uh, clean coal as well as nuclear. Um, others have thrown natural gas in there. Um, as you can imagine, this is a pretty uh, hotly debated issue in Washington. First of all, what is clean energy? Uh, and then what would you get credit for if you put it into your resource mix? Um, I, you know, I think the conventional wisdom is there aren't the votes in the Senate to do it right now. There clearly aren't the votes in the House. Uh, it might get out of Senate committee like it did before, did, did last year. Um, again, it, it, it wouldn't be nearly as confrontational if there was a discussion on price. 
Um, but you still get into regional issues where governors want things built in their states. Um, I think um, Senator Bingaman, he's, uh, he's announced that he's not going to run for re-election, so he's done at the end of next year. Um, he really wants to get something done. I don't know if he's going to try, but uh, my guess is he's going to um, work extremely hard to, uh, to get some kind of a legacy energy policy put in place. And any RES that gets adopted, you must have transmission. You must have transmission in order to share those resources and bring them to load. I, I was just going to add, you know, on that, um, you know, if it does pass and if all the concerns that Jimmy had noted, um, you know, are, are figured out, you know, what counts as uh, renewable energy, where is it located, what then do you have to um, develop to meet the, the new national standard, you're absolutely right. You're, you, I, I think you're still back where we are today. What transmission do you need? Who's going to build it? You know, how is it going to get planned? And most importantly, who's going to pay for it? Question? Yes. My understanding, and I could be wrong, in Florida, you can get a 20-year commitment from the local utility for the purchase of your energy that you'll produce off your rooftop off the photovoltaic which enables a financial model and investment into the whole business enterprise. So the money creates a return. There's a big enough pie ba buyback of the energy so that there, everybody makes money, but we're also producing now renewable energy. In Georgia, my understanding is the local utility won't give you more than a five-year commitment. Preventing any serious financing over the long haul and any rate of return enabling investment into the production, uh, for example, photovoltaic. Granted, we don't have the wind of Oklahoma, but we have a lot of sunshine here. And I, whether these examples are absolutely correct or not, I see a lot of sustainable production going on in other jurisdictions that I don't see here. Are we soft pedaling what is the problem here? Is there a solution here? And yet I see billions that are allocated toward nuclear power in a centralized fashion to keep electricity centralized. So my question is, are we soft pedaling what's really behind the problem? And is there a solution for it? You know, um, if there are, if there were to be changes in, I mean, those are, you know, generally speaking, those are state level rules and regulations that have to be developed, whether it's five years or 20 years. I don't know if that's going to make a difference. So if Georgia enacts the law or the Georgia Public Service Commission required the utilities to go ahead and enter into 20 year uh, power purchase agreements with homeowners, I don't think that's going to make a difference. It might for uh, commercial customers or businesses where a, a five to 20 year time frame makes sense. I don't know if that does for residentials. Maybe, maybe I'm being too myopic here and that's just me. Um, and I'm a long termer in, in my home, but I, I just don't think that that will make a difference. You're saying five year versus 20 year. Will yeah. it make a difference in the commercial setting? Uh, it would make a difference in the commercial and business setting, but not the homeowner setting. So that's, that it's, it's in some ways, I think that's surprising to hear that there is a 20 year uh, horizon in Florida for homeowner owned uh, solar projects or, or even I guess you could even have uh, small wind turbines on the top of the roof of your house. Um, that strikes me is that they're small enough that you could actually do those just on an as available basis and not enter into a long term contract. I mean the price, the, tech, the price of the technology itself has to come down um, before the homeowner is going to invest in it. I don't think it, it's they're going to need a long-term contract to support that. Again, that's just my own personal opinion. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I, I think uh, clearly this is a state jurisdictional issue, and the state um, uh, has authority over uh, Georgia Power, um, if that's what you're talking about. Otherwise, uh, municipally owned utilities and, and other cooperatives, um, they manage themselves. Um, it might be easier in the municipally owned areas and cooperative areas first. Um, uh, and I think that's, a, that's not a indicative of this area only. This, that is nationwide. You can get things done much quicker 
with the munis and co-ops than you can with the uh, with the investor-owned utilities. Um, you know, I don't know that they're wrong in this. They just have a very different mindset, and that is they're responsible for ensuring that there's generation for the peak customers at that peak load. And um, when uh, there are lots of other ancillary issues there, uh, it takes their eye off the ball. But does that mean that they can't do it? No. Um, you know, the Public Service Commission uh, down here, I think like almost everyone across the country, they have dockets where you can participate in. And, the, and I think Georgia Power's IRP is, was one, um, where these issues should be brought up. Um, you can't go to the federal government and get generation issues resolved. It is in the Federal Power Act that generation is specifically the responsibility of the states. So you have to go at the state level and convince those policymakers, e either at the legislature or the Public Service Commission, that the proliferation of, of uh, either wind turbines or solar panels on, on roofs at residential homes uh, would take off if, uh, if some modifications were made to their regulations. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for coming to Georgia Tech to have this discussion. It's very interesting. Uh, being at this venue, however, as an engineer, I have to ask a totally technical question, a question about technologies only, uh, not so much about law. And that um, in the discussion of transmission, all we've talked about really is traditional uh, overland, overhead, wire transmission. Uh, with tens of billions of dollars on the line, can you give us some insight? Does Sutherland or anyone else invest in the research of wireless transmission, which would make pretty much the discussion of siting land-based transmission moot? Wireless transmission, any ideas? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps with a room full of engineers, yeah, I, there is I, someone I, who could I've come read out. about it in, uh, in uh, Popular Science Magazine. I'm not a technical person, so, uh, you know, I keep hearing it. It's been gone all the way back to Tesla way back in the early 1900s. But um, I think the point for today, the relevance today, is that you couldn't finance it and you couldn't build it. And short term, it won't solve an issue that we need to resolve today. But long term, obviously, there is probably a pretty good reason for that. I have nothing to add from the lawyer. <laughs> Other questions? I read recently that the uh, Bonneville Power Authority was shutting down the wind farms in Oregon and Washington because of a failure of, of, of enough transmission and so on. Can you just comment on that situation and whether that's just a very local situation or is that kind of what you're, what you're all about in terms of figuring out the transmission ultimately on these renewable resources? Because, you know, they built it and now they can't use it. Yeah, it's my understanding that Bonneville um, and the wind industry in the Pacific Northwest have been in a um, kind of a power struggle for the last few years. Um, Bonneville has come um, this year and put forth a proposal that would curtail the wind in the Pacific Northwest in favor of hydro. Um, they claim it's merely for the reason that they have to abide by their environmental commitments um, and that they've shut down their nuclear plant and they've shut down other of their own resources as well. And the last, the low-hanging fruit, or the, the last of the resources that has to be cut off is wind. Um, the wind industry basically says that Bonneville, you know, they, it's the Fox Garden, the hen house, they, uh, they own the transmission, they own the generation. Basically, they're cutting off everybody else's generation but their own. Um, I would probably believe the answer lies somewhere in between. Um, I don't think it's a transmission capacity issue. I think it's a question of how they, how Bonneville abides by uh, environmental regulations put on them dealing with fish, but in one that is more transparent and more open and f f a little bit fairer across different resources. That's my understanding. I, I always thought, I thought the issue there was, um, it, it, you're right, not, not so much a lack of transmission, but an o uh, oversupply of generation. Um, and nobody wants to be the one that gets the, exactly, they had, you know, it was a, a big snowpack this year, so there's, uh, you know, plenty of hydropower, so the question is, who do you start backing off first? And, and wind doesn't want it because they are dependent upon uh, the production tax credits and all that. Um, you know, fr from perspective of uh, developing transmission, I mean, the normal model is when the generator comes up and says, I want to interconnect and bring my, my plant online, 
the, the issue for the, the planners, the transmission system planners is, okay, what kind of transmission do we need to, to build to allow you to come online? Um, we'll expand the system, you know, depending upon figuring out cost allocation and, and payment issues um, to have you be online the entire year if that's what you want. Or we can give you something less and you just got to have to take, you know, understand that in certain periods you will be cut, you the generator, because of a lack of transmission capacity. But if what they've applied for is to be able to be online anytime the wind generators are spinning, the planners will study the system, figure out what's needed, and you know, design the system accordingly, and then you've got to work out the cost allocation issues. But so here I think it really had to do more with supply than it was transmission. Other question? Does FERC ever consider um, the nexus between water resources and energy resources in their planning? <laughs> I haven't seen good examples of it in the stuff that I'm reading. Um, I, I'm not a hydro lawyer. That's sort of, you know, part one of the Federal Power Act is it's, it's really its own, you know, shtick. Um, so maybe there's something out there in, in that regard. But no, I mean, and, and you know, I think um, it, th there was a program in the speaker series on, uh, you know, the coming water crisis um, and the shortage of water supply and what that might mean for the energy industry. I, I don't know if FERC is, is on top of that, or at least they may be on top of that, um, but there's not been public pronouncements about it or rulemakings or anything like that that I'm aware of. I would say FERC traditionally is not a planning body. Uh, they leave it to the regions to do their own planning. And then NERC, the reliability organization, has a, they come out with a uh, annual assessment and a summer and a winter assessment, um, which kind of aggregates the visions or views of all of the regions. Um, so I would say FERC doesn't do it. Um, I know some of the national labs, especially ones in the West, have done that a lot. Uh, they've looked at, uh, you know, the fact that um, irrigation water is, or, or water used for irrigation um, has, uh, like the water behind the Hoover Dam, is so incredibly low right now because it's being used for other purposes, and it will have an impact on water at some point in time. We know here in the southeast that there's been an impact on, uh, with the river water temperature and, uh, you know, whether it be too high or too low of water. So if it hasn't been studied that much, it should. I will say NERC's studies or NERC's assessments, um, I have never ever seen them come out and say that we do not have enough resources to plan for the, for the summer peak or the winter peak. They always say we have it unless this transmission line goes out or that generator goes out. And they don't really talk about river issues, but they probably should because it, especially in the southeast and the, in the southwest, they can have a pretty dramatic effect on not just one facility, but lots of facilities along a, a river corridor. Great. Any other questions? Well, let's thank our speakers for their great presentation. And one other thing, uh, or two other things, in fact, just remember that the presentations will be on the secleanenergy.org website as well as an archived copy of the uh, uh, video. And second, uh, look forward to seeing you September 28th, and have a great summer. Thank you.